Hello. Uh, this week we'll talk about disclosure in investor relations. As I mentioned before, many people consider disclosure not just one of the most important uh, most important functions of investor rel relations, but pretty much the only function. In fact, depending upon what textbook you will look, uh, you will uh, use to read about investor relations, some of the definitions you can find would define investor relations with disclosure. I wouldn't necessarily agree with that statement because, as I said before, I think investor relations is significantly more than simply disclosure. At a minimum, it also education of investors. And at a maximum, as I said, it's managing expectations of investors and the top managements of the company about the future performance of the company. But no matter whom you're going to talk about investor relations, everybody can agree that disclosure is extremely important and it serves at least as a foundation for many other investor relations activities. Investor relations is a highly regulated function in the United States as well as in most other countries. We will focus for this presentation specifically on the United States. And the legal environment of investor relations in the United States is pretty complex. We're just going to talk about five major uh, uh, pieces of legislation that influence significantly and shape significantly the practice of investor relations. But of course, there is more. The first one, Securities Act, Securities Act of 1933, as I mentioned in the presentation on history of investor relations, I believe so. This was the transition, the introduction of the Securities Act of 1933, <coughs> sorry, and Securities Exchange Act of uh, 1934, meant the transition from pre-professional period of investor relations to professional period of investor relations. Both of these regulations brought professionalism to investor relations. And so the first one, Securities Act of 1933, again, as I mentioned in the presentation of history, was a response to a variety of um, fraud in the, um, uh, in, in, the, in the financial market. A lot of the stock, a lot of the companies that were offering stock to people were absolutely fake, they're, they're non-existent. Again, the California distant uh, gold fields or Texas oil fields that in reality did not exist. The people simply pretended like the company exists and they will give huge profits in the, in the future. They collected the money and they disappeared. But in addition to the fraud, there were also a lot of companies that legitimately existed, but they did not want to talk about the negative stuff of that may happen to them. It's the negative stuff of their performance. So a lot of the communications to the investors and to the outside world from those companies was all the positive uh, uh, things. The, all the negative information was hidden, all the positive was put out there. And so many, many times, even if it wasn't a fraudulent company, investors were simply losing their money because they, were, they did not have accurate information when the company uh, was going public and was offering its shares for sale. And so Security Act of 1933 introduced specific guidelines about how a company can go public and what kind of information it should disclose to the people who consider buying its, sh buying its shares. So it introduced the requirement for creating a document called Prospectus, which is the information, very detailed, very specific information about the company that the company must make public before anybody can buy its shares. And this requirement still exists today. So when a company goes public, like Facebook or Google, when they were public, they had to release the prospectus, uh, uh, legally called S1 form, and disclose all the positive, all the negative, all the market risks, all potential threats that the company might face to the investor so they can make a 
educated decision about where they should buy the company or whether they shouldn't buy the company and what is the potential risk of doing that. So then the next one that came out a year later was Securities Exchange Act and this one specifically focused on the secondary market of securities. If the 1933 Act focused on the initial offer of securities when the company is just going public, 1934 focused on the secondary market of securities where people already trade in stock on stock exchanges between each other. It's not incorrect to assume that there was nothing between 1934 and Regulation FD that had come out in 2000. There were a lot of changes, a lot of regulations. In fact, Securities Act of 1933 and Securities Exchange Act of 1934 are updated a lot and there are additions and amendments and so on and so forth. Um, but again, this is not necessarily um, possible to describe every single piece of legislation in, in this presentation. So I'm going to skip to Regulation FD. And Regulation FD, sometimes called RECFD, stands for Regulation Fair Disclosure. The focus of this regulation was on providing access to all investors to important information about the company. At the end of the 20th century, the situation was that a lot of professional investors, big mutual funds and pension funds, banks, they had very close access to the corporations. They can pick up the phone and call the investor relations officer or CEO of the company or CFO of the company and ask them questions and get information that will put them in preferential position. They would be allowed to know something that nobody else knows. And as a result, they can trade, they can buy stock or sell stock based on the information that nobody else had, based on the privileged information. And again, by the end of the 20th century, it really got out of hand when regular investors were learning about things only after uh, the, the, the market would collapse or the market would go very high and they would not, wouldn't have an opportunity to react to that information. And so the uh, government introduced the regulation FD to make sure that everybody gets access to the information at the same time. And of course, the um, changes in technology influenced this regulation significantly. Before, it was very difficult, simply difficult to provide information to thousands or millions of regular private shareholders. But at the end of the 20th century, with the widespread development of telephones, where everybody had access to telephone, widespread uh, um, uh, uh, widespread uh, of uh, Fax, fax machines where anybody you can send the same piece of information across the country very easily and very cheaply and of course the internet that was not as developed as it is today but again it allowed for communications and at least putting textual information online uh, um, very cheaply and accessible to anybody and of course uh, securities and exchange commission uh, with its uh, um, Edgar database, uh, the database that contains all the disclosure from all the corporations that have to file that disclosure, allowed people, regular people, to access the information at the same time as the financial analysts can access that information. So Regulation FD is very important milestone in investor relations that the goal of Regulation FD was to create an equal playing field. And then we have Sarbon's Oxley Act, and this one was also, I believe, a response to what's happening in the environment, uh, to the environment specifically. Sarbanes Oxley was a response to the accounting scandals at the beginning of the 20th, uh, 20th century, Enron, uh, Global Crossing, uh, Tyco, and uh, other companies. And one and again, Sarbon Oakley has a lot of different influences on the investor relations, but perhaps the most important one is it introduced personal responsibility for the accuracy of financial disclosure. So from the disclosure standpoint, it is extremely important document. Now, CEO of the company, CFO of the company and IRO of the company must sign and guarantee personally that the information they are disclosing to shareholders is accurate. And that introduction of personal responsibility, I think is extremely important, especially in the post in uh, uh, Enron uh, era of investor relations. 
uh, of course, Sarvon Sokli introduced a lot of other requirement about the auditing of the statement and uh, other regulations uh, related to disclosure. And uh, um, you can read about them uh, um, on your own. And then the, mo the, the, the final one I want to talk about is the Dodd-Frank Act. And uh, this uh, uh, legislation also has a very strong influence on the practice of investor relations because it does talk a lot about corporate governments and the different regulations that need to be implemented that companies, corporate corporations now have to implement to make sure they follow strict corporate governance guidelines. And one of the earliest pieces that went into effect from the Dodd-Frank Act was the um, votes on compensation and disclosure of compensation. And this was a very big point for many companies because they now have report how much money their CEO is making versus the lowest paying the lowest paid employee of the company. And that brings that inequality so much in focus, not just for investors, because this is again publicly available information. Every employee of the company can see um, how much the CEO is making and how much the uh, average employee is making and the lowest paid employee is making. And you know the companies that um, perhaps uh, are not reflected very well in this indicator may suffer not just uh, problems with investors, but they may have issues with the morale of their employees. And the, uh, um, uh, the annual shareholder meetings now include a vote on executive compensation, which again makes it even more challenging now with all that disclosure on the compensation that is now required by the Dodd-Frank Act. So these are some of the pieces of the financial disclosure that uh, of financial uh, regulation that guides the disclosure and guides the investor relations profession. And so what uh, uh, do we disclose? What are those pieces of disclosure that we need to know? The first one is 10K. This is a form that is filed again with the Securities and Exchange Commission. Maybe co many companies publish it on their website as well. But Security and Exchange Commission, after they receive it, that may, they make it publicly available from the Edgar uh, database, um, uh, 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 data gathering and retrieval uh, database. And um, 10K, simply speaking, is an annual report. It's a periodic form. You have to file it every year. And in this 10K form, the companies disclose information on their activities over the last year, including the statement from the top management of the company where they describe what went well, what did not go well, and what they think is going to happen in the future. 10Q, you can probably guess, the same as 10K, only quarterly report. So this is uh, uh, this has been filed once every three months, once every quarter, and it's very similar to 10K. And again, you can find it in the Edgar database, and you can find it on many company um, websites as well. 8K is a non-periodic form. So this is a form that uh, um, that requires companies, and remember regulation fair disclosure, uh, you have to disclose information equally to everybody. So for example, if a company has a private meeting with some investors and the CEO of the company accidentally says something that is not public information, it now becomes selective disclosure because the CEO mentioned it to only one investor or two investors or five investors. It needs to become public immediately and so then organization will file 8K form as soon as possible to make that information public and not to be in violation of regulation fair disclosure. There are obviously a lot of other functions. Anytime there is some kind of material information, something important that happens with the company, the company can file the form 8K with the Securities and Exchange Commission and by doing so the company makes that information public. PNL is a profit and loss statement. Uh, this is the statement that company reports in its 10K and 10Q that talks about profits and losses the company had uh, over the year. Edgar, as I said, is a database where all this information can be found. And right now you can go to Google, uh, you can type Edgar, the electronic data gathering and retrieval database. 
uh, uh, you, you will get to the uh, home page of Edgar on the SEC servers. You type the name of the company and you get all the information the same way as any other investors, even if it's a financial analyst from Wall Street or a teacher in uh, Iowa. Everybody has the same equal access to information from Edgar. Market cap is a measure of the size of the company. Uh, uh, this is a very common indicator of the company. In fact, companies are divided into small market cap, mid market cap, large market cap. And the market cap is simply the price of the share multiplied by total amount of shares traded. So if you want to know how much Google is worth, you can find out the price of one share and then find out how many shares they released. And that will give you the price of Google, although now it's called uh, Alphabet. And for the first time in recent years, we had several companies that went over 1 billion. Oh, wait, I'm sorry. A billion, trillion dollar. So uh, for, the, for the first time recently, there were several U.S. companies that crossed over 1 trillion dollar market capitalization. And of course, you can guess that this were uh, Apple, Amazon, Alphabet, which is Google and Microsoft. Uh, so the, the first trillion dollar market company. So if somebody would want to buy, let's say the whole company, they would need to buy all the shares of the company and they would have to pay more than one trillion dollars for these companies. Uh, globally, there are also a couple of oil companies that uh, had their market cap go over one trillion dollars, the Chinese oil company and then Saudi Arabia oil company. Of course, this can change because the uh, market, the, the price of share of shares can change on a daily basis. The prices of share can go up or down. And uh, uh, some of these uh, trillion dollar companies that went over trillion dollar market, that they went under trillion dollar market, then they went back up over one trillion dollar market. So depending upon when you're listening to this, there might be more or less trillion dollar companies in the world. Uh, companies are divided into private and public companies. So the public company, as again, I said in the previous lecture, is the company where shares are available for the public. Anybody can buy the shares of the company. We can go buy shares of Apple. We can go buy shares of Amazon right now if we wanted to. And because they are public companies, they have to have these disclosure requirements. Many of the disclosure requirements we discussed before do not apply to private companies. They apply only to public companies. There are exceptions, but we're not going to talk about them for now. And private company, then it can be also shareholders company that might consist of shareholders, but it's not available to the public. Not anybody can go and buy those shares, but private companies may be something else. They may not be shareholders company. They may be single owner company. Only one person may own them. Private company may, be, may have other legal forms to operate. And again, depending on the in, in many cases, the private companies do not have those disclosure requirements and many of them, as a result, don't have investor relations officers. P uh, a proxy statement is a document that public companies have to produce once a year. And the proxy statement is produced for the annual shareholder meeting. All public companies have to have a meeting with their shareholders once a year. It can be in person or it can be virtual. and the shareholders have to approve the key uh, operations of the company. Specifically, they have to vote and elect the board of directors, people who will guide the company throughout the year. And the document that is filed for the annual shareholder meeting is a proxy statement that discloses again all the information that the company thinks investors and shareholders need to know uh, about the company for the meeting and then all the voting statements on the share on the board of directors, executive compensations, and whatever other issues are going to be voted on during the annual shareholders meeting. REC FD, we kind of talked about it already. I hope you remember Regulation FD, Sarbanes-Oxley and other regulations, and Dodd-Frank Act, another uh, law governing the practice of investor relations. And now let me quickly show you some financial information in which investor relations operates. I wanted to again emphasize that investor relations officers are not the one who produce 
these financial statements. They are not the ones who create the balance statement, the income statement, the cash flow statement. Uh, this is still done by the treasury department, by the accountants, but investor relations officers should understand them and should be able to discuss them because the investors often ask questions about the statement. So this is how balance statement looks. Uh, the reason it's called balance statement that if you look on the left column and at the right column, the very final number in both of them are the same. The statement must be in balance. One side of the statement describes the assets of the corporation, meaning what the company owns, what it has. And the other side describes how the company acquired all, of the, uh, acquired all those assets. What are the company's liabilities? Maybe company borrowed money from the bank to buy some of its assets. Maybe the company got some money from shareholders to buy those assets. Maybe the company took some prepayments from customers in order to buy those assets. But because the company doesn't appear with assets, it's created and then it acquires assets, these two must be in balance because the company cannot just get stuff out of nothing, out of thin air, out of the blue sky. It's always uh, uh, financing whatever assets it has by something. And so that's why left and right side are in balance. And you can, again, read the descriptions of the, in these examples of the specific assets a company might have and the specific ways it can finance those assets. Income statement, also called profit and loss statement, uh, describes the what was happening with the company over the year, for example, if it's an annual income statement. And uh, revenues are also called sales, meaning what is the overall amount of money flowing into the company, how much sales it generated. Of course, in order to sell, let's say, a car, you have to spend some money, you have to buy metal, you have to buy glass, uh, so you have to buy all the supplies, you have to run, uh, uh, you have to put it all together. So these are all your uh, costs and expenses. And if you take uh, revenues, minus coin and expenses, you get the operating income. This is the amount of income you generated from your main operations by doing your work. There are, of course, other expenses you have to, uh, to spend. Uh, you have to... Uh, um, let's say if you borrowed money at the bank, you have to pay percentages to the bank. Uh, and so there are specific then calculations within the operating income, uh, sometimes called EBITDA, although again, not perfectly accurate description, but for simpli simplification purposes, earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. Then it goes earnings before interest and taxes. Uh, EBIT, then it's earnings before interest after you pay uh, uh, taxes, and then it's um, after you subs uh, sub subtract all the expenses you had to pay on top of your operating expenses, you end up with net income. This is how much money your, your net profit, how much money you generated after you paid all the expenses, all the salaries, all the electricity bills. Uh, all the rent and utilities, whatever else you had to pay, taxes to the government. Um, this is whatever is left. This is your net profit. And it, um, so it is common then to divide that net income by the number of shares the company has and get earning per share EPS, a very common measure. And that allows you to compare different companies between each other. You can see, well, this company has $1 earnings per share, while this company has $10 earnings per share. So it seems like this company generates more money, generates more profit than the other company. And then finally, the cash flow statement. That's another statement that is very commonly discussed uh, with the investors. It is also describes the activity over time. So in this particular case, over a year, if it's in 10K or if over a quarter, if it's in 10Q, but uh, What's different about cash flow statement that it focuses on the actual cash. For example, if a company um, enters an agreement with a if a company enters an agreement with a customer to build, let's say, a car over five years, the customer for one million dollars, let's say, the customer may pay half of that now, but another half in five years after the uh, the car is completed. 
So in the income statement, you would record a whole million because your contract is for one million. But in the cash flow statement, you record you you will record only half a million because you only got half a million dollars for now. The other half will come only in five dollars. You will record it then in five years. You cannot record it now because it's not cash that you have. You don't have it. And this is very important because a company can be extremely profitable and can be making a lot of money. But if all those money are not as cash, if all of them are in the future, the company won't be able to pay its rent, its utilities, the salary to the people. And the employees cannot just call the bank and say, you know what, I'm making a lot of money, but all the money will be paid to me in a year. So can you please not charge me for mortgage for a year and then I pay you everything? That's probably not going to work. And so companies, many organizations, they have these periodic payments they have to do. And if they don't manage their cash flow, if they focus only on income statement rather than on cash flow statement, may end up with a situation that a good profitable company may have to go bankrupt because they cannot pay for their current obligations. So these are the main financial statements, the, the uh, balance, uh, income and cash flow statement. And it is uh, uh, quite common for investors and shareholders to, and financial analysts to look through them very, very carefully. And then if they don't understand something, and this is again, this is the point that I'm trying to make always that investor relations is really not disclosure, it's education. It's not enough to send those out to investors. They may not understand what is net assets from price risk management activities. They might ask you about it. What exactly are those activities? What exactly did you do? How did it affect you? Why did you do it? And so investor relations officers, officers have to understand what stands behind those numbers and what they mean. And they don't have to be perfect experts in it. They can, when the investor asks, you can say, I don't know. Let me go ask in our treasury department. Let me go find out for you and I will get back to you. Sometimes it may be better to connect financial analyst with somebody in your treasury department so they can discuss it together. But again, as an investor relations officer, it is your job to manage and, and, and educate investors on operations of your company. And of course, when financial analysts get information, sometimes they need additional information. They want more detailed information because they create their own financial models. And in many big companies, uh, those are proprietary financial models that help them predict what the company will be doing in the future. And here is the easiest, the basic financial model that's been known for many, many years, the DuPont formula, where return and equity is explained through profit margin, asset turnover, and uh, uh, leverage. And the financial analysts try to get the information from all those financial statements, the net profit divided by sales, or sales divided by total assets, uh, uh, in order to generate the number so that they can pay different companies between each other. And then there is a more advanced version of DuPont formula where you have tax burden ratio, how much companies paid in Texas, and if it's very high in comparison with competitors, they might say, well, you should probably optimize your tax uh, 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 tax base or interest burden ratio if the company borrows too much from a bank, operating income ratio, asset turnover ratio, leverage ratio, the ones we talked about already. So all of this is how financial analysts approach the company and they need additional information. They, they, they ask for that additional information. But again, as an investor relations officer, you are not required to be able to do all these calculations yourself. You have people to help you with that. And your your job is to educate investors on your company and help them find information, help them find the information you need. And in my years as an investor in, in the investor relations, it is common to talk about these things, but a lot of the times, in fact, almost every time the conversation eventually turns to something non-financial. So what do, how are you going to approach this? Uh, or what you are thinking about sales in this particular area? What is your competitive stance versus your main competitors? Why do you think you can do this while the other company doesn't do that? So it, it always shifts to something non-financial, whether it's operational or the quality of management. Another very common topic you know, the investors like to ask about CEO, CFO, or people running different businesses because value is often generated by people. And it's easier to predict the value by looking at people and learning about people and their strategies rather than at the past 
financial performance, which all these um, financial statements show you. So as an investor relations officer, you kind of have to be able to do both. And so finally, I want to show you the website of SEC, Securities and Exchange Commission. This is the organization that maintains the Edgar database. And so this is the home page on the screen of Edgar database. As you can see right here, there is search for company filings, filings option. You can click on that, enter the company name, and you will get all the 10K, all the 10Qs, 8Ks, and other documents over there. And you can study any company you want and get as much information as you want about a company of your interest. And you definitely should do it if you're thinking of investing in a company, but you might want to do it even if you're looking to get a job with this company. Or maybe they are... Uh, you work for an agency and, they are con and your agency considering pitching to them. It's always good to know the organization you are working with and the Edgar database can help you with that.